Welcome, everybody. Can you hear me? Can the people in the back, Nancy, can you hear me? Good, OK. This is wonderful to have so many of you here. I held my breath tonight, not knowing if it was going to snow again. <laughs> That's not funny. <laughs> okay. You are interested in Amelia Earhart, and so am I. And it's probably true that many of you know more about her death than about her life. I would like to talk about her life mostly tonight, although, of course, we'll have to talk somewhat about whatever happened at the end. I find her a fascinating person and extremely surprising, very, very surprising. Uh, maybe you will, too. She was born in Kansas, and I started out when I was cogitating, reflecting on all of this. The, the big question is, how do you get an Amelia Earhart? How do you explain a person who has the kind of interest that she has and the willingness to put herself at risk again and again because of an interest in aviation? Why should anybody be so interested in aviation? By coincidence, maybe, but I think it's interesting where she lived in Kansas is right on the path of the biggest migrations of birds that happen. Maybe she never looked at the sky in her life when she was a little girl. I don't know, but I don't believe that. And I have to wonder whether there was some early curiosity having to do with up there uh, from very early on. She was born in 1897. That tells us that Queen Victoria was still the queen when Amelia Earhart was born. It's hard to put them together in the same picture. It's not a bad idea to think of Queen Victoria because in many ways, Amelia Earhart's upbringing was Victorian. It would really count that way. Propriety and manners, all those things were very important. I want to tell you a little about her family, and I promise you that everything I'm mentioning will turn out, ultimately, to be relevant. Uh, I'm starting with her grandfather. Okay. Her grandfather was the man in Atchison, Kansas, where she was born. He had been a federal judge. People always called him the judge. He ran that town, pretty much. He started the local bank. He was an executive of the railroad. He started the gas company through there. People knew who the judge was. His daughter, Amy Otis, his name was uh, Alvin Gideon Otis, um, Amy Otis, who was Amelia Earhart's mother, was very bright, lively. She wanted to go to Vassar, and she had the papers all ready to send in, raring to go, and her father, the judge, said, no. Why would you need to go to college? You're a girl. No, that's, that's not going to happen. So I won't say in revenge, but it is also true <coughs> that that same daughter was the first woman ever to climb Pike's Peak. This is the mother of Amelia Earhart. And she said, well, I like to finish things that I start. Uh, she was also the head of the local Dickens Society. I think that's related. I really do. I know Amelia Earhart loved Dickens. And I think from having read books that she has written, yes, she writes good books, I think she has the same sense of humor. Uh, if you're a Dickens fan, you know that you can read Dickens and you'll find yourself chuckling at something. It's not fall off your chair laughing, but it's funny. And in exactly that kind of dry, light, amusing way, uh, she tells stories about people too. And she's, she's lots of fun to read. OK, so here she is growing up in Atchison, Kansas. And some sources you read will say she went to a private school. Well, I think that 
can give a false idea, considering that it was a private school of a total of 30 students, grades one through eight, in what had been a stable. So <laughs> it, it wasn't exactly fancy. Um, and that grandfather that I told you about who ran the town had something unfortunate happen to him in 1911 or so. And I have to say it that way, something unfortunate, because from the way it gets talked about, it's very hard to know whether it was a stroke or a nervous breakdown. But whatever it was, the judge was not the way he used to be for a while. This meant that his wife had her hands full. And so the family decided that it was a good idea for Millie, and that's what Amelia's nickname was when she was a little girl, that it was a good idea for Millie to stay with grandma while her parents moved because her father got a job in Des Moines. Now I have to tell you about her father because I have to tell you about the marriage between her father and her mother. The short version is the mother's parents didn't go to the wedding. <laughs> yeah. Um, they did not approve of Edward Earhart. He was a very presentable man, charming, extremely charming, bright. He went to, law, uh, went to Yale Law School, which is where he met Amelia Earhart's mother's brother, in other words, Amelia's uncle was at, at Yale Law School, came home on vacation, had his buddy from law school with him, and the buddy ended up falling in love with his sister. Are you with me? OK, good. Uh, but the family was heartbroken, because even though he was bright and charming and all those things, he was Lutheran. <laughs> that, that would not do. That would not do. The judge and his family all went to the Episcopal, Episcopalian church. Thank you very much. So the marriage did not get off to a great start. And neither did very much for Mr. Earhart. He was bright. He was a competent lawyer. People liked him. He liked to drink. It was like that. He had trouble holding jobs. He had no trouble getting jobs because he made such a good impression, came across so well. So before very long, he had the job in Des Moines. Millie was staying with Grandma, and the family operated at a distance. Now, from everything that I can tell, Amelia Earhart, as a girl, spent a great deal of time alone. And I think that turns out to be important. So she had a high tolerance for silence, for not being around other people. I, I think that's significant. Uh, she liked other people. That was not the problem. And she was peppy, and she liked to do things outdoors. But she also loved to read. And in the big, beautiful house of the grandparents, when she was there taking care of grandma, she also had their private library at her disposal. And she was one of those kids who learned to read when she was five and read everything in sight. So here's Amelia Earhart growing up, loving to read, loving to play outdoors, not seeing her father as often as she wanted to. She idolized her father the way a lot of little girls do. He would take her places on the times when she would get to see him with the parents living in Des Moines. Eventually, she was able to go, and the whole family was able to be together. So he would take them to fun things to do. He took her to a state fair. And I mention that because that's the first time she ever saw a plane. And he asked her if she would like a ride in it. And she said, I don't think so. It doesn't look very interesting. So, so it was a rickety old plane, and that was that. Um, I'm trying to fast forward quickly here. Okay, her, her father's problems got worse. 
He thought he was going to be able to save everything for the family because he had an invention. And in those days, if you had an invention and you wanted to patent it, you had to go with it to Washington, D.C. and go to the patent office, and that's what it took. Okay. He borrowed money from his wife, which is to say from his in-laws, got himself to Washington, D.C., filed the papers, and found out that two years before, somebody else had invented what he invented. And it was a, it was a holder for signal flags to go on the back of a train. And he was sure that that was going to take care of everything. It didn't. He went back home. He drank. Things got worse. It's, it's a sad story. Finally, he and his wife didn't have enough money to pay their taxes. And he said, I hate to ask you to do this, but could you please go talk to your parents and get enough money so we can pull through this scrape? And she did, and they said, yes, we will on one condition. Take a wild guess. Right? All you have to do is leave him, and she didn't. OK, she didn't. Uh, it, it was like that. It was like that for a while. What was happening also is that as he would continue to get, lobs, get jobs and lose jobs and get jobs and lose jobs, the family moved a lot. Uh, in one period of four years, I can think of, they moved four times. When she was in high school, they moved six times. When she was a grown-up, somebody would come up and say, hello, I'm from your hometown. She would say, which one? <laughs> okay, it was, it was sad. It was very sad. In high school, when she started, she was doing terrifically well. She was an excellent student. She had a strong aptitude for science and math. She was also very good at English. And I can tell you she's a beautiful writer, beautiful writer. So she was going through high school and thought everything was going to be fine. <coughs> Meanwhile, things between her parents got worse and worse and worse. And during high school, they separated. And meanwhile, both the grandparents had died, leaving a terrific amount of money. Uh, the grandfather died in 1912, excuse me, the grandmother died first, and she left $170,000 in 1912, which in today's money is worth a little more than four and a half million. One year later, the judge died, and he left even more. Now, there's a brother in there, right, the uncle who was also the Yale lawyer. He and everybody was very concerned that Mr. Earhart was going to get his hands on all that money. So he did what a lawyer knows how to do. He tied it all up. The will was extremely com complicated. And it was made that way deliberately to ensure that Edward Earhart could not get his hands on Amy's money. Eventually, Amy, the wife, who was having a very hard time with her two daughters who were getting to be of college age, broke the will. And then she was able to get the big equivalent of something like $1,200 a year then, which is worth more than that now, uh, but able to get some money from it uh, because her brother had been so difficult. So here's Amelia Earhart getting through high school. She wanted to go to Vassar. She got the papers in too late. That didn't work. Her mother said, well, look, I have this money now. Let me pick out where you should go. And so she enrolled Amelia at a place outside Philadelphia called the Ogontz School, spelled O-G-O-N-T-Z. That means something to some people in the audience, I can tell. Uh, it was pretty much a finishing school. I've read letters that Amelia wrote while she was there describing things that they were doing in class. And she said, well, today 
we had to arrange all, arrange all the chairs in a circle, and there was one chair in the middle, and we had to practice, first of all, how to sit down, and then how to shake hands while sitting down, because some of us were still brought up that ladies shake hands when they're sitting down. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what was passing for her education. One year in Christmas, at break from this school, she decided to go and spend it with her mother and her sister who were in Toronto at the time. Now this is getting to be during World War II, excuse me, during World War I. Canada, of course, was in World War I before the United States was. So by going to Toronto and working in a hospital, which is where she wanted to work, she was able to see wounded men coming back from the war. And she became what she had probably latently been to some extent, a pacifist, which was exactly in line with her Quaker grandmother from Philadelphia. And she couldn't see any sense of it. She worked very, very hard at this hospital. And then it was time to go back to the school where they teach you how to shake hands. And she lasted a couple of months there and finally wrote her mother a letter and said, this is not what I want to be doing. With your permission, I would like to resign from this school and come and work at the hospital. Come and do something to help. And her mother said, fine, if that's what you want to do. So she moved to Toronto, worked there. By then, it's the winter of 1917-1918 working around sick people, right? Some of the patients, the nurse, the women who worked there became friends with them, and some of those men were pilots. So on the days off, sometimes the men would do flying demonstrations for the, the young women who worked there. And one of those times, Amelia was out watching this dashing young British pilot do stunts and he sort of buzzed where the people were standing and everybody ran and Amelia didn't. And she wrote about this afterwards. She said it was, it was almost mystical. She said, I really felt that that plane was saying something to me. Very odd. Okay, so she was working there. Men are coming back. 1918, men returning from war. Is this ringing bells with people? The sickness that was happening. That was the year of the great influenza epidemic that killed 100 million people worldwide, right? Killed more than the war did. There was Amelia working there. She didn't get the flu, but she did get a bad sinus infection. She got a bacterial infection. This is in the days before antibiotics was very bad. The solution in those days was a long and complicated and painful surgery with a long recovery period. She went through all of that. When she was recovering, by this time her mother and her sister had moved to Northampton, Massachusetts because her sister was getting ready to go to Smith and Amelia needed quiet and rest and she decided that North, Northampton was beyond quiet. It was boring, as far as she was concerned. <laughs> and so looking for something interesting to do, she found that there was going to be a 10-week course in engine repair. <laughs> and she really wanted to learn everything about engines, about how to listen to an engine, how to know what's wrong with an engine, how to take it apart, how to put it back together. She loved doing that. And so she took that, and um, then the mother and sister, next thing that happened, they sort of moved to Boston. I have to say it that way because it wasn't stable. The reason it wasn't stable is because word came that her father was all right. Families develop their own euphemisms, I think. And to say that he was all right meant he stopped drinking for now. 
So the mother decided to go to California and see if they could really make things work. And she did. Yes, that's where he was. He, he, I should have said that. Yeah. He, he was in California. And so Amelia and her sister joined the mother in California to see if he was going to be all right. Well, not exactly, okay. So they went back east, just to give you an idea of what it was like. They uh, went back east and Amelia was studying. Um, she decided that she wanted to try medical school and so she did. She enrolled in Columbia Medical School. She was accepted, she was doing fine and then in the West, her father got worse. Everybody had to move back to California. This time it looked like it, it, this is really, this is it. He's going to be just fine now. While she was there, she started noticing things that were going on in California that you couldn't do back East. California had the perfect terrain, the perfect climate for flying. The word airport didn't exist but there were air fields. There were 20 of these just in the greater Los Angeles area and that's where her father was in that area. And every weekend there would be air shows as they were called, demonstrations of flying. Now the demonstrations were pretty dramatic because what made California such a good place besides the terrain and the climate, it's also the movie industry was getting going. And if you were a lucky pilot, you would get to do your stunts in a movie. So all those things were going on at once. Her father was there, the air shows every weekend. So for a while, Amelia and dad went to a different air show once a week. Excuse me. Then it finally happened. Excuse me. Finally happened that they were at a show and her father said, You want to try it? You want to take a ride? It cost $10 for 10 minutes. Yep, that was a lot. And she said, Oh, yes. So she went up with uh, the pilot, was a man called Frank Hawks. And he was condescending to her and she knew it and she loved it. And then she thought about that later and she and her father kept going to shows and she said to him, you know, I think I'd like to try. I, I think I'd like to have lessons. And he said, great, I'll get Frank to teach you. She said, no. She knew that if he was already being condescending to her that he would be as a teacher also. She said, no, I'm going to find a woman to teach me to fly. So she did, found a woman called Netta Snook, S-N-O-O-K, who was very well known. She was so well known that she could sort of ask for whatever she wanted and get it for the lessons. And Amelia said, well, would you, take me, would you teach me to fly? Yes. What do you usually get for that? $1,000. Amelia said, I do not have a thousand dollars. And this generous woman said, that's all right. When you have, you can pay me back. So she was terrifically excited about being able to do this. She had to figure out what to wear. That was tricky. Planes didn't have a door. So to get in, you had to climb over the side of it. She went to, for her first flying lesson in a riding habit. She thought that was the most practical thing she could do. Put on the helmet, tucked up all the hair inside. She had very long hair. Um, this was absolutely wonderful. The next thing she told her father she wanted to get a plane. Well, that took a while to arrange that. But she did learn how to fly and her, the next problem she was trying to solve is, okay, how do I turn this into making a living? Because at the time, if you were a pilot, you had to give lessons or give people rides to get paid for it. Nobody wanted to go up with a woman, right? They, they said it was just crazy. Now, we might think, oh, they, they were just learning, but they were right. Flying was extremely dangerous in those early days. Um, 
the first group of 40 men who were hired when they were trying out the idea of mail delivery using airplanes, of those first 40 pilots, 30 died. I mean, it was, it was like that. It was very, very dangerous. It was dangerous because the planes were still primitive. There was absolutely no way, once you were in the air, to have contact by radio with the ground. You were up there, and they were down there, and that was that. You couldn't get good maps, right? useful map for a pilot. Uh, you couldn't get good weather information. So there were many problems that hadn't been worked out yet. Um, I'm going to have to fast forward quite quickly for a while here. OK, let's pretend that all of a sudden it's um, 1927, OK? That's the year that Lindbergh did something very dramatic. Yes, OK. Uh, from New York to Paris by himself. <clears throat> Terribly exciting. There were women who were flying. There were many women who wanted to do what Lindbergh had done. Many women died trying to replicate that flight immediately afterwards. Uh, you know, we hear about Amelia Earhart doing what she did and the tremendous hoopla because of it, but you don't hear about the other women. Uh, there's a wonderful, wonderful resource, the New York Times Historic. I don't know if this library has it, but it's, a, it's an online resource that is great fun. Uh, you can actually look at what the newspapers said, and I've spent a lot of time looking at old New York Times stories. And there was one person um, named Ruth Elder who was some kind of a beauty queen. And the stories about her in the New York Times are so amazing because they say things like, this, this woman was good looking and she could fly a plane. <laughs> It's, it's just so astounding. I mean, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. I'm really not. That is what the stories say. Um, Ruth Elder was smart enough to have, a, to have help in her flight when she tried to cross the ocean. She and her assistant made it as far as the Azores, right? Just off Portugal, sort of. Crashed into the sea and had to be rescued. And it's a good thing they got rescued when they did, because soon after they were rescued, the plane blew up in the water. So uh, that was all over the New York Times. When she came back, when Ruth Elder came back to safety, uh, in no time at all, she had a big contract. I mean, for huge money at the time, $250,000 contract for a vaudeville show. Right? If she would go around and do an act, I don't know what that would have looked like. She took it. She was going around. She got two movie contracts. Now, I mention this because there's something about Amelia Earhart that I found before that I could never understand. It was that when she returned from her successful flights, um, that the person helping her said, and I'm sure she doesn't want anything theatrical. And I thought, now that's, that's a very funny thing to say. You know, why, why would you say that? And for a couple of years, I didn't understand that at all. And then eventually, if you keep digging, you answer your own questions. So there we are. So Lindbergh flew across the ocean. One year later, it was getting to be a year later, there were people who got the idea that it would be such such an accomplishment if you could have a woman repeat that, even if she didn't fly the plane, because nobody dreamed a woman would fly the plane. If, if you just had a woman make that trip, that would be fantastic. So there were some plans underway to do it. And one plan that almost happened involved a woman called Amy Guest. And Amy Guest was associated with a very, very wealthy, very wealthy family. And she was going to uh, go with two people, a navigator and a pilot, and was going to cross the ocean. And so she 
part of why people were so excited was because she could pay for so much of it. So she got a plane uh, that was prepared for her. The plane was made by a company, I will spell it. Uh, there are children here. It was F-O-K-K-E-R. This was a Dutch company. <laughs> and actually, it was the company that had been in Germany first, and they made the planes that the Germans used in World War I. It's very interesting. Anyhow, they knew how to make good planes. So Amy Guest, who could afford any plane, had them make for her a tri-motor plane on pontoons, bright orange, huge thing, it was called the Friendship. At the last minute, she couldn't go. And so the people who were organizing that trip said, well, you know, we've got we've to find a woman. We have to find a woman. She has to be a woman who can hold her own around British aristocrats. So she has to be a girl of the right kind. So at this time, uh, Amelia Earhart was working in Boston as a social worker at a place called Deniston House. She got a phone call. And the man said, hello, Miss Harris. You don't know me. Uh, my name is Hilton Riley. I'm a friend of George Putnam. And we are uh, putting together a trip for a woman to go on a transatlantic flight. We'd like to. She said, I don't know you. Uh, you'll have to tell me more. And he said, well, if you'd come and meet me, then we could talk about it. And she said, all right. But she went with a friend. And she found out that what they wanted her to do was accompany a pilot and navigator on a flight in that brilliant orange plane that I told you about called the Friendship. And they were going to keep it secret. Now, I don't know where you hide a huge orange <laughs> airplane on pontoons <laughs> in Boston Harbor, but they did. And they managed to keep it quite secret. Uh, Amelia agreed to do it. She was going to do it. She didn't even tell her mother that she was going to do this. Um, so there she was uh, in the plane. The pilot was somebody called Wilmer um, Stultz, S-T-U-L-T-Z. He is the great uncle of Natalie Stoltz, if any of you know her. She lives in Chittenden County. Um, he was the pilot, and the mechanic on board was somebody called uh, Slim Gordon. The deal was the pilot was going to get $20,000 for doing this. The mechanic was going to get $10,000 for doing this. Amelia Earhart was going to get the right to talk about it and write about it. Uh, but of course, if she made any money from that, then she would turn that over to Amy Guest. And Amy Guest would have to approve whatever she wrote to make sure that it upheld the dignity of the family. It was like that. OK, eyes are rolling all over the I can see. <laughs> <laughs> Amelia was happy to do it. Actually, there was a rumor in Boston that she was doing it only to help her family with their financial troubles. And she told the promoters, she said, you have got to squelch that. Put it in the New York Times. I am not doing this for money. I am doing this for the honor of being part of something wonderful. So they did. And that was the end of that rumor. Um, they took off from Newfoundland, finally. They went up to. Um, is it uh, tre Trepassy? Is that how they say that, Joe? Trepassy, T R E P A S S E Y. Okay, that's how we'll say it. They were there and they went to Harbor Grace, Newfoundland. <clears throat> they had information about what weather to expect. It turned out to be not quite right. Um, if you're told that there's going to be a storm, in an hour and you get to the storm before you're supposed to get to it, then you probably think that you're off course. They thought they were off course flying. And they were getting near, they thought, near land. They weren't sure exactly where they were in the plane. Remember, no radio contact with the ground from the plane. Um, you can't, they couldn't get radio contract, contact back. 
So what they did sounds crazy, but it's what other pilots had done. They saw a ship and they wrote a note and tied it to something. And th th this, this often worked, right? This, you'd say on the ship, please tell us where they are. And then on the deck of the ship, they would write in huge letters, <laughs> write the coordinates. Yeah, it was a method that worked, except when they did it this time, they missed the boat. <laughs> no? OK. So they didn't really know where they were. They thought they were probably on the, on the coast of Ireland, maybe. Okay. Um, they, they were in Wales, <laughs> near Wales, actually Cornwall, closer. And they landed, and people didn't really know what was going on. <laughs> So they sort of stayed in the plane. They were exhausted. They were quite exhausted. So they just slept. And then finally, somebody got out to them and knocked on the door. And they said, oh, well, here we are. We've come. They said, okay, okay you know, we're, we're all right. We made it. Good. Come on in. We'll celebrate. It was amazing. So big welcome. Um, That, yes. How long does it take? How long does the flight take? Funny you should ask. Uh, I'll answer it by telling you the name of the book that Amelia wrote about it. It was called 20 Hours and 40 Minutes. Yeah, that's a short crossing from Newfoundland to Wales. 20 Hours and 40 Minutes okay, is how long it took. In the welcome that they got, both there and then when they went to London, Amelia was furious. And the reason she was furious is because she was getting all the attention and all the credit. And she said, look, I was cargo. She said, I was on that plane like a sack of potatoes. I didn't fly. I didn't navigate. I, they should be getting the credit. But all the attention was, had to do with her. So that had been pretty much one year after Lindbergh's flight. Then it got to be five years after Lindbergh's flight uh, by 1932. And that was the year that she decided that she could fly across the ocean solo, that she was going to do it. And she was spending quite a lot of time by now with the man who um, was the promoter named George Putnam. And if you're thinking, isn't that a publishing? Yes, that is a publishing house. And yes, that was his family. And yes, he did publish her books. But he also <coughs> considered himself a publisher and a promoter because there were people very interested in promoting aviation because they saw great business prospects for it in the future. And they wanted to get in on the development of it. So these promoters were hoping that they could make some important things happen. George Putnam was one of those people. When they met, Amelia was engaged to someone else, to a man in California who expected her to be a housewife. And she eventually had to tell him she wasn't interested. And George Putnam was married to somebody. And that wasn't working out very well. So over the few years when they spent a great deal of time together, Amelia and George became very close. And eventually they married. Uh, he, his wife had already started divorcing him anyway. So they married. Um, I mention this because of a letter, a very important letter that she wrote to her future husband practically the night before the wedding. And she said, look, um, I think we can make a go of things, but I just want to be sure that you understand my expectations. <clears throat> she didn't use the word independence, but she said, I need to be free and I would allow you the same freedom. 
and I hope that you don't expect to hold me to any medieval code <laughs> of fidelity. And I'd like to try this for one year. And at the end of one year, if we find that we're not happy together, then I have to ask you to release me from this arrangement. And he agreed. Now, at that point, when she married him, she was probably the most famous woman in the United States of America. There were five people at the wedding. Okay, that's how she wanted it. They went to his mother's house in Connecticut, and there was a judge there to do it, and there was a witness, and there was a cat, and that was pretty much it. <laughs> and the New York Times, of course, tried to write it up the way they write up weddings, and it says, uh, the bride wore a suit of brown, and her, <laughs> her hat was brown, and her stockings were brown. Apparently, brown is Miss Earhart's favorite color. <laughs> Really? I didn't make that up. They, they did say that. Okay. So uh, she was becoming more and more famous. She kept on flying. You know that. Uh, 1932 was also the year of the Olympics in Los Angeles. She got there by flying herself there and in doing that broke a record for crossing the continent. Um, she kept experimenting more and more. She was becoming more and more famous. I'm trying to tell you everything in time to give you some questions. Um, she was invited to a big meeting called Conference on Current Problems. And that was in 1934. In 1934, the, big, the biggest current problem was unemployment in the United States of America. So this was a conference that brought together leaders from all sorts of different areas to see what they could think up for jobs for the future. And there were people like college presidents and company presidents at this meeting. And one of the people in the audience was the president of Purdue University, a man named Edward Elliott. And he said to her, I'm going to ask you to come speak. And she said, fine. So a year later, he came back to her and said, I have an idea. I, wa I want to invite you to come to Lafayette, Indiana and work for us. And she said, well, you know, a college teacher, I don't. He said, that's OK. You come. We will find a position for you. So he invented a position to have her the consultant in the Department of careers for women. He made it up. But she knew that Purdue had a very well-equipped airport and that they had a good aeronautics department and that they had a big budget. And she told them that they said, in effect, tell us what you want to work on. And she said, I'm very interested in projects that investigate the effects of long distance flights on pilots. And they said, oh, that sounds like a good idea. And so they designed for her what she called a flying laboratory. It was a uh, Lockheed Electra with modifications. And that turns out to be very important, the modifications. And that she would be able to use this to go on a very long flight. So of course, when she got ready to make her flight around the world, this was the plane. She had a plane that she'd used to cross the ocean. She had used it to go from Oakland to Hawaii, breaking all sorts of records. But that plane was getting old. And she knew for something very long distance, you need a very big fuel capacity, which is very heavy. And so you needed a bigger, stronger plane than her little one. So they designed this plane for her. Meanwhile, she and her husband invested in it, too. And her husband, who was the promoter, had the idea of getting special first day cover stamps. Stamp collectors know what these are. And that Amelia would sign these and then mail them from all the different places she stopped going around the world. 
and he bought these for a dollar a piece and planned to sell them for five dollars a piece and he bought 10,000 of these. So they, she and her husband invested in this venture too. So that, all of that was going on when she finally started the flight. First, she was going to fly around um, starting in California and going to Hawaii in that direction. But they had very bad problems in Hawaii, problems with the plane, had to be sent back to the factory. And she said, okay, we're going to do it a different way. So they flew to Oakland, and then they went from Oakland to Miami. And in Miami, they announced, we're on our way around the world now. Uh, and they kept going. She had, she had to have a navigator with her. And the man that everybody recommended to her was a man called Fred Noonan. They said, when Fred's all right, he's the best. <laughs> so here's a man who has the same problem that her father had had. And there are people who think that, you know, people didn't give her father a second ch chance enough she probably thought. And here was her opportunity to help a very, cap very capable man by giving him a second chance. And so she decided to risk it. That was one of the risks. Uh, they say when, when he's all right, there's nobody who's better than he is. OK. Now, he, he was not inexperienced, you have to remember. He had already worked for what would become Pan Am. And he had worked out lots of routes. So he could help her in ways that a lot of navigators couldn't. And I don't think that she ever regretted that. Um, as far as anybody can tell, he was fine for the, for the whole, as far as anybody can tell. Okay. So uh, she went from Miami to San Juan, Puerto Rico. Then she went to the east. I'll have a map in a second. The eastern end of Brazil, across to Dakar, uh, kept going that way, stopped in Karachi, which was then still India, kept going, kept going. Um, in Indonesia, way out there, uh, they had some kind of a problem. And from out there, she was able to talk to her husband on the phone. And the next place she was supposed to go was New Guinea. And her husband said, uh, OK, when you get there, you know, there's nothing wrong with stopping at that point. You already have gone so far. You'll have got so much data. It would be perfectly all right if you stopped there. Because he was concerned about a problem that they had had just before that, a mechanical problem of some kind. And when he talked to her on the phone, she said, well, we, we may have had some problems with personnel. And so there's speculation that what that meant was that there was a problem with the navigator. But you know, who can be certain of that uh, in retrospect? So she had permission. He, he was also, I think, telling her that because they had invested in this, and he wanted her to know that she had that freedom. Very quickly, there, that's the ebook that I did. This is what she looked like. Uh, that's the leather jacket she bought when she started. She slept in it for three days so that it would look old. Uh, this is the That's the plane I told you about, the huge orange plane. Here she is. Um, I think this was done after they met the photographer. I think this was a setup shot, because when they first got there, she was absolutely exhausted, and so was everybody. I'm showing you this because I don't know if everybody can see it, but she has a gap 
between her two front teeth. The only reason I mention that is because George, uh, her advisor, George Putnam, her advisor, husband, promoter, publicist, said, from now on when you smile, will you please keep your lips together? This, this isn't the look we want at all. And if you notice, you don't see that again, you, mostly, rarely. Does that look like somebody having fun? Yeah. You know, after she made her, her uh, Atlantic crossing which was by herself, which was horrible, the plane was on fire, she didn't know where she was, she couldn't see anything, she had to fly on instruments for hours, she wrote a book about it called The Fun of It. <laughs> this is a later picture, whoops. Okay. This is the governor of Vermont at the time in 1935. Let's see if I can go backwards. I wanted you to see this one very much. I can't make it stop. Okay, get a good look if you can. <laughs> this is how this is a dance that they talked about in the New York Times where you sway like a plane and then there's a dip and then there's a whirl. Be because uh, there had been a dance, remember, called the Lindy, which was for Lindbergh. So this was hers. There she is with someone famous. Notice she's got her hat in her hand. She hated to wear a hat. The only time she ever wore one was when she flew across the ocean and was in Paris and met the French Senate. She thought fashion just absolutely required it. She gritted her teeth and did it. This is in Burlington, Vermont. This is in 1934. Uh, this person is, that's the mayor of Burlington, a man named Mr. Burke. Uh, that's Amelia Earhart, of course. This is a person called Jack Shearer, who is still alive. Yes, Chevrolet. And somebody told me that uh, he, they said he's living in Vail, Colorado. So I called him up. And I asked him if he remembered this. And he said, oh, sure, I remember that. I said, what do you remember? And he said, well, I remember I didn't want my friends to see me in that monkey suit. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I said, do you remember the plane? And he said, yes, I remember how dirty it was. He said, we always called those the dirty birds. So I guess the runway was muddy and so. Uh, that was the key to the city that he's carrying. That's a cushion with the key to the city. And this is a lady from the Zonta Club. There she is with the governor. This is 1935. She was in Vermont repeatedly. She was very good friends with a man called Porter Adams, who was the president of Norwich and who was very interested in aviation. Um, actually, she was the matron of honor at one of his weddings. <coughs> yes, yes, that's right. This is a picture, I wanted you to see this because I found this online and it said online that this was a picture of her in front of her Lockheed Electra 10. Well, it is a picture of her, but that is not the plane. So just to warn you that everything online is not to be believed. <laughs> Here's the map. Um, this is the second map, but anyway, here we are. That's Karachi, which was still India, to Calcutta. Here she is. She was trying to go to, um, she was trying to go to Rangoon, but she didn't quite make, no. She was trying to go to Bangkok, but only made it to Rangoon. That was it. And then here, 
there was uh, mechanical difficulty and she had to backtrack Australia. And here is New Guinea. If there are any among you who do crossword puzzles, uh, you may know the name of LAE, which is the port in New Guinea she took off from. That's where she left from. Uh, she was supposed to be going there, Howland Island, which is one mile, no, excuse me, it's a half a mile wide, a mile and a half long. And depending on who you believe, the charts they were using were not accurate, or they were. But uh, they didn't have the best maps. She never made it to there. There was a Coast Guard cutter there, the, the Coast Guard ship, the Itasca. And the only real concrete primary evidence that anybody's got is the log from this Coast Guard ship. They can they did record what she sent them by way of radio uh, information. So there's that. But she was looking for that, but there was heavy cloud cover. She didn't know that because she hadn't heard the, the amended weather forecast that she needed. When she was leaving New Guinea, she was in a hurry. She wanted to get going. So did Noonan, so did everybody. It had been a long flight. They were very, very tired. Let's get going. They were also worried that the monsoon season was going to really raise havoc with what they were doing. Some people think that because she was in such a hurry that she didn't get enough detail about the radio frequencies or didn't tell them enough about the frequencies she would be broadcasting on because ultimately what happened is um, they were sending her signals, which she got. But when she sent her answers to them, they couldn't No, Excuse me. She couldn't hear what they were saying. They could hear her. That's the right way. And as a result, uh, she was lost. Now, what happened? Okay, I don't... It's a mystery, is what happened. There have been many theories. Uh, you've probably heard a few. One is that she just plain crashed into the ocean. But there's never been any wreckage found no material evidence that she crashed into the ocean as such. Uh, there have been pieces of things found, but it's very difficult to say if it was her plane. There was one piece of plastic that people thought was from her plane, but the problem was that you couldn't get blueprints of the plane as it was when she left because she had had modifications made to that original design. So a dado, for example, a piece of plastic on the original plane, they thought they had found that she didn't have those. She had a lot of things taken away from the plane to reduce weight, right? Uh, there were no passenger seats, for example. She didn't take a parachute. Um, so it was all about keeping the load light. So there's no satisfactory physical evidence that the plane crashed into the ocean. Some people think that she landed on an island and survived for a while. From what I've read, I think that also. The, the best evidence is from that. There's a group called, uh, the acronym is T-I-G-H-A-R, the, Inter the International Group for Historic Aircraft Recovery. And they have got tons of data what they think is that she landed on an island, uh, used to be called Gardner Island, now it's called Nico Maruru, in the nation of Kiribati, uh, out in the Pacific, and that she survived there for a little while. The reason for thinking that is there were radio signals coming from there, and these wonderful people at T 
T-I-G-H-A-R, collected data and worked out tide levels and surf uh, readings and times of day, and they put it together to discern that the times of the radio broadcasts that came presumably from her after she presumably crashed matched what would have been possible to be transmitted from that island. And then after a little while, uh, the surf and the tide were stronger than other forces and the plane was taken to s back, uh, was, was gone. There are other theories. One theory, a man was there in 1952 as part of something called Operation Ivy. He saw a plane covered with vegetation and coral, and he said, what's that? And they said, oh, that's Amelia Earhart's plane. He said, oh. 30 years later, he decided to write a book about it and say that he was sure that was it. And the book is one long racist rant against the Japanese. And his claim is that she had to be um, destroyed because she had seen things when she was there that those sneaky, dishonorable Japanese were making military preparations out there when they said all they were doing was fishing and trade and that what she saw made her dangerous and so that's what happened to her. Uh, the theories get crazier. There was another one that's a man named Joe Class, K-L-A-A-S, who wrote a book called um, Amelia Earhart Lives! Exclamation point. And he said that she had never died at all, uh, that her name was Mrs. Bolam, B-O-L-A-M, and that she was living in New Jersey. <laughs> And then there was, a, uh, there was another book. There was a man who had met Mrs. Bolam at, uh, at a social event on Long Island in the 1960s, and he decided in 1985 to write a book about it. And he said that when he met her, she was wearing a round pin. And it was a medal, and it looked exactly like a medal that Amelia Earhart had worn. And then he waited and waited and used this wonderful computer aging technology that they use for children. And he had a photograph of Amelia Earhart and had hit it, it advanced to what she would look like in her 70s. And he said, aha, you see, that's Mrs. OK. Uh, and that was never really believed either. The first one, the book by uh, Mr. Kloss, when he said, you were really Mrs. Bowman and you live in New Jersey. Well, Mrs. Bowman had a lot of money and she sued him and she sued his publisher and she arranged to have the books that he had written that were in bookstores taken from the shelves and pulped. So you could say that didn't quite work. So um, as far as I'm concerned, it's still a mystery. She is nevertheless admirable and I think astonishing and an excellent writer and I'm going to read you a tiny tiny bit from a poem that she wrote. The name of the poem is Courage. It begins, Courage is the price that life exacts for granting peace. The soul that knows it not knows no release from little things. Okay. It goes on. I won't. You have been very patient, and thank you very, very much.